good afternoon and thank you for the introduction, ma'am. So today I will be talking about um, assessing vulnerability of fisheries to climate change impacts using the locally developed tool named Tool for Understanding Resilience of Fisheries. So a brief run through my presentation this afternoon, I will first discuss um, climate change and impacts of climate change to fisheries and followed by the significance of the study uh, which discusses the Philippines as a very vulnerable country and the present status of coral reefs and fisheries in the Philippines. And then it will be followed by the main um, body of the presentation, which is the tool for understanding resilience of fisheries, its framework, its history, how to, how to use the tool, and what's the application of the tool. And I will provide an example in which case uh, I will use uh, Boracay Island as an example and followed by the summary. So climate change. These two words have been the focus of research efforts for the past um, years, mainly because we are beginning to see the effects of climate change to our livelihood, agriculture, and even our safety and survival. So often, we associate these terms in, with storm surges, acidification, and the more famous ones or more familiar ones is the typhoon and global warming. So as defined by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, climate change is any significant change in the measures of climate that lasts for an extended period of time and the measures being dependent on the temperature, precipitation, and wind patterns. And because, and of course, we associate, we usually associate climate change to global warming which is just an aspect of the one only, only represents one aspect of climate change. So global warming only deals with temperature. So global warming defined as the recent and ongoing global average rise in global average temperature, which is attributed to the increase in concentration of greenhouse gases. So temperature really affects our system in so many ways, like for example, they affect chemical reactions, physiological functions, and um, it is then that we consider temperature as one of the main drivers of climate change. So in this um, graph, we, in this figure, we can see that um, increasing greenhouse, greenhouse gas concentrations drives the climate change in our in Earth. So with human activities, there's an observed increase in global anthropogenic carbon dioxide emission. Carbon dioxide is, by the way, one of the greenhouse gases. So with human activities such as fossil fuel burning and for deforestation, there's an observed increase in the emissions of carbon dioxide. So from 1850 up to 2000, you can see that there's an increasing trend. And this, in turn, affects the global average greenhouse gases concentration. So, um, monitored on the same period from 1850s to 2000, we can see that there's an increasing trend of greenhouse gas concentration. So, this greenhouse gas concentration has a huge effect on our system. Like, and they produce this climate change hazards. So, for example, um, the increase in greenhouse gas concentrations would have an effect on air temperature. So, this air temperature is maybe responsible for the formation of the typhoons. So, there's an increasing um, storm frequency and also um, with direct effects such that um, the seawater has increased in carbon dioxide. Car in carbon dioxide, so it has an impact on the decreasing pH of the seawater. And also, with rising water temperature, the ice caps are beginning to melt and it contributes to the sea level rise. So these are some of the uh, evidences of the hazards I mentioned earlier. So with sea surface temperature globally, they observed an average uh, increase in the sea surface temperature. So as you can see here from 1880s to 2010, there's an increasing trend. And in the Philippines, we have observed an increase in 0.64 uh, degrees Celsius from the period of 1951 to 2010. So this um, this figure here is uh, is from the Coral Reef Watch uh, website of the NOAA, where it, they they they, monit they have this daily monitoring of sea surface temperature anomaly in our uh, territory. So we can see here that the eastern side of the Philippines is relatively cooler as compared to the western side. And this is used to track um, 
possible oral bleaching events. And as I mentioned, that the high sea surface temperature has an impact on fishery, so mainly affecting the physiology of this uh, species, those living in the marine environment, and also yeah, they they can also affect the, uh, the abundance and the distribution of uh, this species. So this has potential impacts to fisheries such that the changing in timing and level of productivity will affect the overall production of fisheries. Another um, evidence is that the increase in ocean pH, so we can see here that uh, from, the, from 18, 1985 to 2005, we monitored the oceanic carbon dioxide, carbon dioxide concentrations and with the corresponding increase in carbon dioxide concentrations, there's also a corresponding decrease in ocean pH. So this spurs the ocean to an acidic, hence the term ocean acidification. So it has implications on biology of organisms and the ecosystem processes. So we can see here in figure number two, so this is uh, from the U.S. commercial fishing vessel revenue. So this just uh, say, says that the colored bars represents the um, organisms affected by acidification, while the blue bars are those that are uninfluenced. So this has huge um, implication on in terms of uh, catch value. And of course, where we are more experienced, the change in frequency and intensity of rainfall. So globally. There's an increase in trend in precipitation intensity and also in the Philippines, but as has observed, an increasing trend in frequency and intensity of extreme rainfalls. So, this um, rainfalls can also cause um, run, sediment runoffs, and um, and when it, they turn into typhoons, they damage the near shore habitat. So, um, this near shore habitat, such as the coral, seagrass, and mangroves, um, serves as a protection to the coast. So with um, reduced or damaged habitats, there's also a reduction in the protection of the coast. So the coasts are now more exposed to wave and storm surges. And also, as mentioned earlier, the individual responses to environmental conditions, so the timing of reproduction and the recruitment, and also the shift in distribution and in terms of their the growth and survival of the species living in the marine system. And this has, uh, uh, this has implications in their reproductive success and the composition, which will in turn translate to, uh, in terms of the perspective of the people, so there's a reduction in catch and worse could be the disappearance of these species. So this would, reduction in catch would translate to low income for our fishers. So I often would ask, so, so what? I often ask, so what, 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 um, why do we need to assess vulnerability? So I will just reiterate what I said earlier, that climate change, people, and marine ecosystems are connected to each other. So as you know, people depend on marine ecosystems for goods and services, and that um, the, the activities of the people affect um, their marine ecosystems. And we, as a major driver of climate change, so are the ones who drive the climate change, which in turn affects both the people and marine ecosystems. So reason number two is that the Philippines, our country, is a very vulnerable country. So this is a graph of uh, nations who suffer most from extreme weather events. So uh, from the period 1992 to 2011, we ranked number 14. But when they consider 1993 to 2012, jump from seven, from 14 to number 7. So for total of events that happened to our country from 1990 to 2012, we have a total of 311. So that's huge. And in this map, we can see that almost, you might see the Philippines anymore here. Yeah. And this is that tropical cyclone track for the year 1948 to 2005. And this is the typhoon frequency in the Philippines. So we can see here that most of those in the Central Visayas region are affected by the typhoons. And now we have observed a, a change or a shift in the usual typhoon track. So now they are beginning to hit the Mindanao area. 
And with this, I'm sorry, with this um, study by Berg, um, they have uh, identified the drivers of vulnerability in highly vulnerable nations. So this, they have identified three drivers. So number one is the high or very high youth dependence. The second is high or very high credit exposure, and the third is low or medium adaptive capacity. Again, I will just uh, mention that the three drivers of highly vulnerable nations are high risk dependence, high threat exposure, and high adaptive capacity. So where's the Philippines? We're right there at the intersection of these three drivers. So meaning, we have these three major drivers of vulnerability. And in relation to very high risk dependence, the status of our Philippine color is now, um, yes, as you can see this um, map, we have a mostly poor coral cover in the majority of the sites and just 4% of um, sites with excellent coral cover, those with 76 to 100%. And they, they, um, this decline in coral, coral cover is attributed to a majority the anthropogenic, anthropogenic threats, mainly overfishing, destructive fishing, pollution, sedimentation, and coastal development. Not really mentioning the natural variability, which includes the typhoons, that also affects the our coral reef. And of course, because fisheries is one of the very important sectors in our country, so nearly 60% of the population is dependent on fisheries, especially those living in the coastal communities. And that, as of 2006, um, the poverty uh, poverty ranks. Um, figured out that the fishers are the poorest of the poor sector. And with, um, when we compare the, we compare the historical um, fish catch, they have found out that the average catch of Filipino fisher folks is less than one half of what they can catch in 1970s. So this is, uh, this is not an updated map, but it shows that most of the coastal areas in our country are highly exploited already. So now we go to the main part of the talk, which is the tool for understanding resilience of fisheries. So this tool is uh, locally developed. It's developed by Filipino marine scientists in our institute. And its main objective is, of course, to identify vulnerable fishing communities. And in addition to that, uh, it, it also demonstrates how to link the results we, when we use the tool to climate change adaptation and in turn draft action plans towards reducing vulnerability. So this tool is um, included in one of the tools in the this guidebook, so the vulnerability assessment tools for coastal ecosystems. So they actually are uh, they have three tools, one of them is this behavior, the other one is uh, deals with coastal integrity. And the other one is uh, a combination of the fisheries and coastal integrity. It's included there. And the framework of this tool is already published in Fisheries Research in 2013 by my colleagues. So the features of this uh, tool. So what I like about this tool is um, the target end users is the local stakeholders. So um, this includes barangay captains, uh, local government units, even Bantay Dagas, Fisher Folks, and that the spatial scale we are looking at is the barangay level. So earlier, we've seen that the Philippines as a nation is very vulnerable. But if we can we can still zoom in to the Philippines, so we can zoom in up to the barangay level and see how um, the vulnerability levels in these areas vary. And for the climate change hazard considered, we consider wave and storm surge and the sea surface temperature. So again, the, this tool is very simple. So the required data, I will show you later, is very accessible and easily generated. And that the analysis, which involves the scoring and ranking, is very simple and devoid of mathematical uh, equations. So walang math. And the assessment is very participatory. It allows us to validate um, our results. And it also assists in decision making for local adaptation strategies. So this tool follows the um, vulnerability framework of IPCC, wherein vulnerability is a function of exposure, sensitivity, and adaptive capacity. So exposure is defined as the extent to which a region experiences changes in climate or 
for example, in direct contact or are exposed. Or, for example, in the Philippines, we can say that the west, the east side is more exposed to typhoons as compared to the west side. So for the sensitivity, it, um, it deals with the responsiveness of the system to climate change. And when we combine exposure and sensitivity, we get the potential impact, this, which is all impacts that may occur given a projected change in climate. So, but if we consider also the adaptive capacity, which is the basically the ability to adapt, the capacity to adapt to changes. So the net result of this is your vulnerabilities, which is defined as the extent to which a system is able to cope with negative impacts of climate change and extremes. So uh, later has, aside from the, based on the IPCC framework, has three major components. So fisheries, fit ecosystem, and social economic. So for fisheries, of course, because it's, it, it discusses about fisheries, so it's, it examines the type of fisheries in the area. While for the reef ecosystem, um, it is considered because the life history, characteristics, and behaviors of target species are important biological features that provides insights to vulnerability of the fisheries. So the ecological significance of this reef ecosystem are emphasized, considering that um, there is an interaction between the species and within species and within um, habitat. And of course, for the social economy, we consider this as part of the uh, term because um, it, because of its tight relationship with fisheries, fisheries resources. So this is the framework of the tool. So as I discussed earlier, it's based on the IPCC vulnerability framework. So this you can see here the exposure sensitivity and to gain the vulnerability. So in this case, we will be using for exposure, the wave surge. And for uh, the sensitivity and adaptive capacity, I mentioned earlier that it considers three components that are interrelated to one another. So the fisheries, ecosystem, and socioeconomic. And with each uh, component, there are criteria that I will be discussing shortly uh, later about the uh, how to answer this, about the uh, criteria of this uh, framework. So this is uh, the, the same framework, however, we emphasize on this how to gather the data needed. So basically, it's more of the primary data and the secondary data. So the primary data being, we can use one-on-one um, -on -one interviews, focus group discussions uh, with key informants, and then um, for the habitat assessment for the reef component, you see here, um, it requires uh, light intercept method and the uh, fish visual census. But we can also use secondary data if the if we have data limited situations. So we can also use a municipal profile, government websites, previous reports to answer those criteria. So for the exposure, um, the feed and uh, her group uh, have produced this map of uh, clustering of the Philippines based on the uh, where what hazard they are exposed to. So this is um, one of the highlights of the resiliency program. But um, in in this tool, we will uh, we will focus on the wave or the relative exposure index. So uh, luckily in our institute we have this laboratory where in where we can ask them the levels of exposure and not undergo this um, mathematical equation. So they just uh, they will just give us the value for the exposure of our uh, of our community of interest. But for this presentation, I asked them what are the important input data for the exposure. So they said that yeah, we needed the volumetry, the host line, and the big data. And they calculated it using the wave exposure model. So one of the input, uh, in the output of that model is this map. So they combine the northeast range relative exposure and the southwest range to get to get the total relative exposure index. So we can see here that for Batangas coastline, um, there is a varying exposure relative to the whole uh, province. 
And this is also done with other coastal communities. So as you can see here, they have done for Ilocos Norte, for Cagayan, for Batangas, and of all the sites we have applied this to. So we now go for the sensitivity um, aspect of the turf, in which I will start with the fisheries. So this fish, uh, in the fishery sensitivity criteria, they only consider three questions or three criteria. So the, um, the first, the dominant catches. So um, in this setting, the sensitivity, when you have higher score, um, it's not ideal. So the ideal score here is low because when you have high score, then you are highly sensitive. So the ideal, actually the ideal answer to this uh, criteria is this, those located in under the low. But I will discuss each. So for the dominant catch, the basic uh, uh, dilemma is that whether it's pelagic or demersal. And the basis for this is that the pelagics uh, mostly stay in water column and they are highly mobile as compared to demersal fishes, which are mostly habitat associated. So uh, imagine if there's a destruction in your habitat. So the number one that will be affected will be the demersal species. So they are more sensitive. Uh, in terms of catch rate, and this is used as a proxy for standing fish stock biomass. So you can see here that there are uh, there are thresholds. So these thresholds are derived from the result of assessment for 40 municipalities. So they have categorized on what on what uh, catch will be the threshold. So here we can see that the lower your catch, the higher, the more sensitive you are. So the impact of weight exposure on usual habitats with lower catch is greater than those with higher catch. And that for gear dependence, um, that's the interaction between the fishing gear and the habitat. So the mostly mobile gears are more favorable and that the habitat associated gears are more sensitive because they will suffer the same vulnerability as those that are site attached. So imagine again when you have habitat and it gets destroyed, so your habitat associated gears will also be they also be exposed to the same vulnerability. For the reef ecosystem we have three criteria. So they consider weight tolerance species relative to total abundance. So you can see here that the pectoral swimming fishes is less sensitive as compared to the site attached uh, fishes. And the basis for this is that since these uh, pectoral swimming fishes are highly mobile and strong swimmers, they can withstand a uh, high weight energy environment as compared to the site attached fishes. And the density of coral dependent fish uh, again is in relation to the their habitat association so the more dependent they are the more vulnerable they are to the climate change impacts so we can see here that the less your coral dependent fish are the more the less sensitive you are and of course in terms of coral cover the the less cover you have the more sensitive are because um, it also translates to your capacity to uh, to house more species. So with less coral cover, then less diversity to fish, and in turn it has an impact on when climate when the impacts are there to affect the habitat. This uh, fish species are will be more likely gone. For the social economic part, we consider population density and fisheries ecosystem density. So that's a basic because the more crowded you are, the more sensitive you are because more people will get affected. And also it it relates to the use of the resources. So the more crowded your most life is, the more um, your resources are exploited as compared to this um, not crowded setup. So in terms of fisheries ecosystem dependency, again, dependence on fishers. So the more dependent, the more fishers present in your community, the more sensitive they are. And now we go to the adaptive capacity. So adaptive capacity is more of 
somewhat a, pa a positive connotation. So in here, in the adaptive capacity, the higher your score is, the the better. So the ideal um, ideal characteristics of ideal answers to this criteria is those located in this high column. So for the fisheries, we consider habitat extent or the fishing grounds, um, such that the larger your fishing grounds is, the better. So you know, extensive habitats can harbor several target reefs, reef fishes, and it also reflects higher coral, higher coral species richness or high habitat complexity. So, so that uh, this habitat, uh, larger habitats can serve as a refuge for juveniles and adult coral, adults that are coral dependent. For the average size and amount of catch, so you can see here that. The most uh, small and immature fishes are scored low, while those about the large fishes that are most likely spawners are high in adaptive capacity. And the reason is because, um, as I mentioned in the introduction, the effect of climate to the reproductive behavior. So mostly, since fishers, since fisheries is size selective, so the larger ones are. Uh, they usually target the larger ones. So, if you have larger um, fishes, then most likely you are more adapted to uh, changes because you have more fishes below your tropic level. And for the occurrence of juveniles and prime fisheries, it is associated with the recruitment patterns. So, recruitment, you can see here that for uh, high adaptive capacity are those with uh, abundant juveniles during um, occurrence. So, in relation to the recruitment, that is very important to the fishery. So, the more recruits, the may, they they can translate to higher fish stocks in the future. So, um, communities with um, juveniles or prime fisheries is more adapted as compared to those which has no or minimal prime fisheries. And also, lastly, the change in catch composition, wherein um, those communities with no change in catch composition is highly adapted, has higher adaptive capacity as compared to those with uh, considerable changes. So this is because, again, the fisheries is size selective. So eventually, through time, the larger ones are are fish and then what remains are the smaller ones so there's a change in catch composition and this also translates to losses in species diversity through change in catch composition so it indicates uh, the change in species diversity indicates uh, low adaptive capacity for the reef ecosystem again uh, we have two so in this the extent of habitats Large, larger reef areas will have higher adaptive capacity and that this presence and condition of adjacent habitats uh, is very important, especially in ontogenetic habitat shifting species. So those that utilize coral, seagrass, and mangroves in their life cycle. For the social economic, it's mostly associated with um, income and the dependence of the community to fisheries. So here we can see that uh, two of the parameters are related to the annual, the income from fisheries and the other one, this is fishers with other sources of income. So the higher the income of a place, the, the higher their adaptive capacity is, that's obvious. And that um, fishers with other sources of income will usually have higher adaptive capacity as compared to those fishers who are full-time or entirely dependent on fishing. So, for example, typhoons, um, these uh, fishers with other sources of income can still earn something, but those that are fully dependent on fisheries cannot uh, make money for that uh, duration when there are typhoons. So, this is how a score sheet looks like. So for, uh, again, the target, the scale of this um, tool is the barangay level. So we usually assess six um, barangays 
depending on the funding of the project. So we have uh, sensi the sensitivity attributes and then the scoring system again for low is 1 to 2, medium is 3 to 4, and 5 is high. And I, I forgot to tell you, the scoring is, uh, some of the criteria in the scoring is objective, some is subjective. So you may uh, use an expert's opinion to answer uh, a criteria, especially if there's uh, if the data is very limited. Anyway, so this is the scoring process. So you'll just add this uh, the scores for this uh, criteria, and then uh, convert this numerical scores to, to rank. Later on, I will show you how to convert. And by using the exposure from the exposure model, we can derive the the potential impact. I will show you how later in another slide. So the same goes for the vulnerability. So for the adaptive capacity, we again list down the criteria and add the total score and translate the numerical score to rank and use the potential impact from the previous slide, the rank from that to gain the vulnerability. So this is the scoring system. So we can see here that uh, each of the components is listed. So the fishery, fishery ecosystem, and socioeconomic and the sensitivity and adaptive capacity. So the minimum and maximum total scores are listed and usually for uh, easy purposes, we divide the intervals by three for the medium high. So from here, we can uh, translate the numerical scores to um, rank scores. And then after that, we can use this um, table to get the intercept for the rank of potential impact. For example, if you have medium exposure and uh, high sensitivity, so medium and high, you get the high potential impact. It's easy as that. And the same will go to go through the vulnerability. Like for example, you have high potential impact, but your adaptive capacity is high as well. You get medium vulnerability. And you will do this for the all the three components, so the fishery, stream ecosystem, and social economy. So after getting the vulnerabilities of each component, we have this overall vulnerability. So again, it's the intercept of the uh, parameters. So for example, you, you get you gain a medium fishery vulnerability and a high a reef ecosystem vulnerability and then a low social economic, so that's MHL. In positive the yellow, so that means you have an overall video vulnerability. So what's the so what? So what's the application of the uh, vulnerability result? So this will this will come to the next step. So the next step is basically the adaptation, uh, the adaptation part wherein yes, as discussed, uh, defined here is the adjustment in natural or human systems to reduce harm. So our aim is to reduce sensitivity and potential and exposure or the potential impact and increase our adaptive capacity so that we can reduce our vulnerability. Like for from high we go to medium, from medium to low and low to that vulnerable to increase our resilience. So in this portion I have uh, a proposed adaptation strategies uh, specific for sustainable fisheries with the acronym RESTORE by my boss. So um, this is usually um, used uh, during these adaptation strategies, but uh, during our workshops, they normally uh, look for this as a basis on how they, will go in, they are going to plan. And from the vulnerability results, so they, have, they can identify the action, the top three action or how many, uh, any number you want, 10, 20, they will identify actions that are more, most relevant to the vulnerabilities of each parameter. So they can use, for example, in the fisheries, they have uh, diverse catches, so they can use, they can um, think of doing something for that uh, criteria and put that in adaptation actions. And um, they will need to answer if the action that they put is uh, 
will answer the urgency and the capacity. So does the action address an urgent need? So there's an, also a score, a scoring, so low, medium, high, so one of you. And for the capacity, is there an operational capacity to implement the activity listed in the adaptation actions? So after that, this is um, the urgency capacity matrix wherein for it, uh, you will know how to prioritize your actions to reduce the vulnerability. Like for example, in the urgency, you have high, you have very urgent um, issue that can be addressed using this um, action, but you have very low capacity. So it will go to the priority number two. As compared to if you have uh, the capacity to do that, uh, to do that action. For example, you have funding. So if you have urgent, high urgency and high capacity, it will go to priority one. So that's that means that's the action that we need that we need to prioritize. So for the case study, um, this is the map wherein the turf is applied. So native to the uh, projects that includes BA assessment in the deliverables, we are able to assess this and. For my uh, case studies, I will be using the Boracay Island, which I presented in APCRS in Taiwan. So, Boracay Island, I know you're you are all familiar with Boracay, so it's a first class municipality. It has 17 barangays, 12 are coastal, and an estimated uh, visitors of 1.3 way back in 2013. So, the number of fishers as of 2012 is 870. And again, the Boracay Island, which has three barangays, so 62% of the total municipal population live in the island. And there are marine parks or marine protected areas located around. And the main source of income, of course, is tourism. As compared to the mainland uh, part of the municipality, the mainland Balay, which comprised only 38% of the total municipal population, and has um, other sources of income is the fishing and farming. So you can notice the, the huge difference between the mainland island uh, component. So for the wave exposure, again, we generated this from the Physical Oceanography Laboratory. Um, they have identified that Barangay Katiklan, where the airport is, is highly exposed to wave as compared to the other five barangays. So again, I normally we use six barangays to assess, but if there are enough funds, it's the idea is we assess the all coastal barangays. So for now, we assess just six um, based on the number of features. So for the vulnerability, so here's the results of their vulnerability. So for the fisheries, um, the main contributing factor for their fisheries vulnerability is this: the demersal catches. The average cash is low. Um, the presence of habitat associated years. There's a significant change in catch composition and few occurrence of prime fisheries. So for the reef ecosystem, they have low proportion of weight tolerant species, low coral cover, and few adjacent habitats. And for the socioeconomic, um, their only main driving factor is the high population density because it's compensated by the um, amount of income, so the vulnerability is the adapted capacity is more on this socioeconomic. So the overall vulnerability doesn't change much. So it's low to medium. However, even though the vulnerability is low to medium, doesn't mean that you don't do something about it. So they have listed actions um, based on the vulnerability results. So the actions and how does it contribute to the reduction in the vulnerability? This is an output of their workshop. So we can see here, like for example, the review of sewage system in the barang island barangays will cause the low uh, potential impact. And um, the needed um, actions for implementations comes under the socioeconomic, ecological, and governance where we can see here how, how do they deal with the review and sewage system? On what sector do they um, pass to and coordinate to do this sewage system review? And also they consider if there are potential negative impacts. So for this the sewage system, they said no. 
and that the added value address the climate change concerns. So this is their uh, urgency capacity, as you can see, uh, most of their actions proposed fall in the priority one box. So because the advantage of Boracay Island is they have funds for these um, uh, projects because we pay, we pay the environmental fee when we go there and other sources of uh, income from the other sector. So we can see here that uh, these actions, though they are not directly affecting the fisheries, have indirect um, associated to the an indirect association to fisheries. Like for example, um, this regulation in water sports in Marangay Island, um, this uh, is related to the fishing ground use of the municipal fishers. So mainly they are being displaced, so they have no fishing ground to use because these water sports are everywhere in their municipal um, grounds. So there's a call for zoning in the waters of Malay to address the conflict between the fishers and the tourists. And of course, this strengthened enforcement in relation to the um, enforcement of the Bantay Daga in arresting or preventing um, illegal fishers in the municipal waters. And of course, the review of marine park ordinances in the island. And here we can see that there's also a taken beach vegetation for the uh, aspect of adjacent presence of adjacent habitats. So, luckily, we are able to follow up on follow up after the sorry after the uh, vulnerability assessment. So, in most of the sites we uh, we enter, um, we cannot we have haven't followed up on their activities such that uh, or uh, are they doing what they plan to. So for Borangay Island, I was able to follow up on their post pre activities and um, good thing that they have started on mangrove rehabilitation, seaweed farming for the fishers as other source of livelihood, and the beach to leaf IEC for information education for awareness, um, raising awareness on the environmental issues in the in the municipality. And also, they have conducted the refresher course for Batay Dagat on ordinance to uh, strengthen their enforcement. So, to summarize, uh, climate change has direct and indirect impact to fisheries and that the identification of vulnerable areas is just the first step towards climate change adaptation. We observe that site-specific attributes contribute to the overall vulnerability of the area. And that creator is a very simple tool, which is really dedicated for non-scientists to use and apply in their community to identify vulnerable fishing communities. And the results from this assessment it, um, allows the identification of adaptation strategies to reduce um, potential climate change impact on fisheries. And lastly, vulnerability differences and adaptation measures can shift the outcome of any climate change. So they say that prevention is better than cure and that um, with planning, we can be more ready to face the climate change impacts that will be coming for the future. So climate change, yes, with these tools, we can do something about it. But what's really good is not just we can, but we will do something about it. So thank you. very much, Ms. De Ramos, for uh, giving us an overview of how to use the turf, VA, VA turf, in uh, assessing the vulnerability of the fishery sector to climate change. So the floor is now open for your questions, comments, and insights. So please use the microphones along the aisle and kindly identify yourself and the organization you represent. First question, yes, Dr. Mauricio. Uh, thank you, Mom, for your very uh, interesting discussion of the effect of climate change on fisheries. Uh, I am a forester 
and uh, in our uh, ADD project, funded, uh, funded project, ADD funded project in Northern Palawan, and World Bank project, funded project in Caracas, we noticed that uh, the mangrove forests and the beach forests uh, were uh, being destroyed, and uh, the complaint of some of those fish fish pan uh, owners is that uh, they are uh, giving up their, uh, their uh, projects because uh, they, they have no, well, there is very much, uh, there is no more mangroves or very, very, there is no more uh, mangrove species or beach forest to protect their uh, uh, fish ponds from uh, shall we say storms and the strong winds and uh, in rains. Uh, also, uh, we noticed that uh, in some of the lakes, like uh, well, in these areas, the the water sheds affect the fish, the fish, the fishery projects in the lakes. So, what do you what uh, how how Will, will this be included in your uh, vulnerability assessment? Thank you. Thank you for your question. Sir, so, um, and I forgot to emphasize that this uh, vulnerability to fisheries is for marine fisheries, so not the lake um, fisheries, because I know that the dynamics will be much more different in the closed system as compared to the marine. But I think they can, um, the lake scientists, they can develop a similar tool to assess vulnerability in terms of uh, freshwater fisheries. And in terms of the mangroves, uh, yes, yes, it's important to have mangroves, but um, there's a recent article by Dr. Primavera that says that it's not enough to just plant mangroves, it's important to know which species of mangroves should be planted and where should we plant them. So I, if they have, they have uh, no mangrove species left, I think they can still try to uh, plant as long as that's the, say, uh, the appropriate species for the environment. Any more questions? We mentioned that there were that uh, you have identified several adaptation strategies yes. to combat climate change, to mitigate the effect of climate change. But in your case study, you, you did this for more high. How about the other areas? Um, Many of common uh, adaptation strategy that uh, that was implemented in, in these other areas. So your, uh, the adaptation strategies are always site specific because each site has different um, characteristics. And in the case of Boracay, since they are somewhat rich because of their tourism industry, uh, they, if we compare this uh, island to another, like for example, the one of the sites of my project is Birdie Island Passage in Birdie Island in Batangas City. So that island has no electricity, no water source. So when we compare how they uh, they have they formulated the adaptation terms, it's very different. And also because the characteristics of and the contributing factors of vulnerability to the Verde Island is very different from Boracay Island. So basically, no similar adaptation strategies if we are talking about this. Yes, ma'am. Thank you for the very interesting presentation. How many, how long does uh, the vulnerability assessment take and, and what constitutes the team that does it? As well, then up to the adaptation planning, how much would it cost? Uh, okay. So 
So in our project, so since we are uh, required to do the field work, so we collected the data needed for this filter. So that includes the fisheries and also the habitat assessment. So the habitat assessment mostly needs the divers. But if there are previous reports from a uh, site, we can also use that. And um, with this, we usually, um, after data collection, we pre-score. Um, our team in Marine Science Institute, we pre-score the, uh, the criteria, and then we conduct a workshop. So in the workshop, we invite the local stakeholders, local government units, the MAUs, even the mayor, sometimes they can attend, and also those that are directly related to fishery, such as the fisher poles, the bantay dagats, and with the help of the technical team, so in the MSI, we can, the VA facilitators, we present to them the data we gathered, not the score, but we pre-score that, so to validate if our scores is in accordance to their opinion. And also, they can object, like for example, one participant says that, oh, we scored this two, and the other one says, no, it's three because this and this, and I can provide evidence to that. So there's a consensus among the participants. And after, actually, the the, vulner, the vulnerability assessment workshop takes uh, three days, but that is because we also consider the coastal integrity and the uh, other tool, because this is uh, one of the three tools in the vulnerability assessment. So for this, we usually take one day, and from the scoring, from the validation of scores, we go directly to the adaptation action. So then we just need the Manila paper and then the participants and then brainstorm on what adaptation actions we need and then with the planning process. So and usually we of course we I know we we send them the results and then after I think three months or I I'm following up monthly in case of Boracay Island on how's the conditions are the adaptation plans in process. And the good thing about this um, tool is that from those adaptation plans, they can also incorporate them to the disaster risk reduction plans or the CRM plans in their municipality. Yes. Hi, Ms. Diraos. I am Val Madre from the Institute of Computer Science. Uh, presently, I am working uh, I'm doing image analysis for coral, coral reef images. I was just wondering if there's any aspect or areas in your field or in your project where you felt the pressing need for automated tools development, which our department or our institute can help you with. we need um, tools to uh, to address especially those that are very hard to do assessments or for the um, usually say for assessing the coral reefs uh, some of the data that we are using is remote sense so remote sensing data because that can be used as a proxy pero um, if we have the actual data we're in my colleagues type into the uh, ocean and assess that. So we will use that. But there's also a proxy. So needed. So we may available the remote sensing data. Yes. And also as okay po merong mga tools na ma develop to for easier assessment. So knowing the criteria, we can Yes sir. Hi, <laughs> I'm Jake Dixon from IPS. Uh, to answer Val's, uh, maybe suggestion to Val, since you're including live coral cover, maybe you can get a video of the reef. Um, Val can find something that can identify live corals Parang on a broad scale. Is that uh, CBC, uh, um, no, like um, Yeah, video transect Val can probably some automating stuff to identify live corals um, because that's what he that's that's what he does. Okay. Um. I also 
my concern is um, the percent coral is relative, right? Mm -hmm. yes. So relative. You, there, are, there are areas that have high coral cover, but because of the patchiness of the reef, like yes. sand, it still scores low sa BA. Okay. So, no, I so <laughs> my concern is um, what happens when the reef is naturally patchy? compared to a um, um, well-developed reef. So I think that if you get, we, we, also, we, all, we usually measure only 50 meter reef, 50 meter transects. So I think um, if you can actually do broad scale video transects and then have valve automate, maybe that's, uh, that's that could be. Yeah, we can use that to have a better score with regards to coral. Because um, uh, corals develop in different ways. There are patchy corals, but still uh, in good condition. So I think that relative 50%, 25%, that's a relative over. Um, maybe we can do a broad, a larger scale assessment that would be better. Suggestion? Thank you. Okay. Okay, this is more common to fix uh, and cross. Okay, um, uh, this project where she picked up uh, her work from is part of Philcor, and the Philco program considers three islands: Verde, uh, Boracay, and Kamigi. Now, now. There would be uh, differences big in how coral corals would be scored, considering that she also gave a picture of uh, their assessments in coastal areas. So if you have a handle that you can share with us about what the scores are like in coastal areas, you think nyo, kasi and then therefore the adaptation is. Para may handle kami how things deep are really that different. Island ecosystems will have a different. Um, Coral cover compared to those that are attached, that are fringing the posing. Yeah. See, you are in a handle. Because dito ang priority is, dinahana na bora pa na ayan. So may follow up ba kung kung sa mga pinagagawa nila uh, in this aspect. Kasi itong alam ko na itong work na to was pre ayan. Yung VA na yan, pre ayan. But uh, in the case of Boracay and Kabigi, when we compare the coral cover, so Kabigi has higher coral cover than Boracay Island. And so in, I haven't included, but uh, one of the, eh, there pala, the folks we in this island is the coral refurbishment, so they began coral transplantation in areas in the island where there is no coral. So they learned this from, yeah, so the transplantation of corals to increase the life of coral. Yeah. A map that shown other VA studies there. So, Limbawa, uh, Umatangas, oh, that, oh, well, that's also island. You give up in the island ecosystem. Molinao.
will ask when I get back to the Ah, sir B. Discuss the same. The difference between the island and the mainland for the cover. Do you have any idea? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, well, um, in terms of. Uh, uh, Can you use the microphone? Um, the actually it's um, different different physical factors um, uh, operate in the fringing reef, mainland fringing reef and island fringing reefs. So in island usually sedimentation is less kasi nga walang malala, walang major river systems. While in the mainland, so you, you tend to find different coral life forms in an island. And the, ano, but um, difference? Uh, in terms of cover, right? Um, I actually don't know any trends, but usually, um, in terms of embayment, you have different. You have a more diverse group of a uh, group of corals, more diverse, more diverse in terms of life form and genus composition than in an exposed island reef. But usually, it's all related to. It's all related to, there's, a, there's usually a strong correlation between um, the population density and the condition of the reef. So if you have a, so um, usually we find more developed reefs sa mainland. You have bigger reefs, you have bigger reef flats, more developed reef uh, so, so in terms of um, yun yung sinasabi ko in terms of uh, score, malalaki yung reef doon and you have so mas matas so kahit mababa yung cover nila it still offers oh, kasi malaki yung area nila which is kasama naman sa mga sa island fringing, I think they're more vulnerable kung ano sa island fringing 